And then we're going to uh, receive the morning offering. And then we're going to just continue with worship in song and just move right into that portion. So join me in prayer, please. Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you so much for who you are, for your love for us. And God, I'm thankful that we can rejoice even in difficult circumstances. I think of Dave and Nancy and Greg and just their continued uh, faith in you, even though they've been going through some very difficult trials and circumstances. Uh, we lift up Dave, especially as he's in this skilled nursing home, as he's working through his occupational therapy, his physical therapy. God, I pray that you would just bless him, give him strength, help his body to heal. God, give him some answers as to why he's having so much trouble with uh, his leg, his hip. And uh, God, we ask that you would just prevent any more injuries. I'd be with Nancy as well as she is caretaking. Just uh, uh, love on her, provide her the strength that she needs, and just help both of them to continue to keep their eyes focused on you. Father, we lift up Greg Williamson as well. and We thank you, Lord, for the progress that he's made in his battle with the pancreatic and liver cancer. Father, we pray that you would bring healing to them, that you would just touch his body. And uh, God, use this as a way to show your power and your majesty and your glory. Uh, we praise you. Uh, just for so many other needs that we have in this church, how you have been so faithful to us in uh, the financial area, as our budget is strong this year. Father, we, we just praise you for that. And, and God, we ask for your wisdom. Uh, give us your insight as we have this business meeting next Sunday, that we would be very wise, that we would keep our eyes focused on uh, doing the things that we're called to do in honor of you and, and following you. And we praise you, Lord, for the 13 individuals who are up for membership. We we praise you for that, and I praise you, Lord, that there's a number of people who are uh, coming in behind that for another round. God, you're doing some great and awesome things in this church. And Father, it could be very easy for us to look at, at, at the, the growth and the improvements and say, wow, look at what we're doing. The reality is, Lord, this growth is coming in spite of us. Father, I pray that you would just help us to keep our eyes focused on you. God, we have a community around us that is hurting, that is broken. We have brokenness here in this room today. Father, I pray that you would be that amazing healer that we need at this time. That you would direct us, that you would guide us, that you would protect and encourage us. As we receive the offering this morning, Lord, we thank you for, again, just the sacrificial giving that so many people are involved with here at the church. And we pray for not more money, not necessarily more resources, but that we would just be very much in tune with what you are calling us to do in this community, in this region, in this world, as we serve you above everything else. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.
Will you stand and worship with us? We're here to worship Jesus Christ today. We've been talking a lot about praying the names of God in the last few weeks. Uh, we started off by saying how Moses um, talked to God through the burning bush, and um, God spoke to him and said that his name was Jehovah, which is I am. He's the self-existent one. It says in Romans 11, 33, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and to him and through him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Let's worship him, the great I am. The mountains shake before you, the demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell, nor any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am.
As Moses learned to trust Jehovah God, the great I am, God was preparing him to lead his children out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And so he split the sea open so that the children of God could walk right through it in safety. And Egypt was often used as a picture of sin and slavery to sin after that point. But when God sent his son, Jesus, he came to rescue us from our sin and from our slavery to that. And it says in Isaiah 42 that the Messiah would come to open the eyes of the blind and to free the captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. And because of Jesus, because he took our place on the cross, hallelujah, we can be free from that slavery to sin and fear. And those who trust in Christ are called children of God. And no longer slaves.
delight it's our pleasure just to receive that gift with an open hand we say it in jesus name amen you may be seated amen. all right kids you can head to the back for junior church and we're going to continue on in our study on the different names of god in the old testament last week i gave you a test and you did so well i'm not going to give you a test this week isn't that just a great feeling Okay, maybe you don't really care about tests, so next week, I'm going to have a big one. We're going to call it the mid-season final. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help, trying to help wherever I can. Our name today is probably a name that you're familiar with, at least part of the name. You should be familiar with the first part, right? Jehovah, that's been a consistent every week. We're going to add to that word Jehovah today, the word Shalom. So the name of God that we're going to look at is just that, Jehovah Shalom, and it means the Lord is peace. Now, peace is one of those ironic words, isn't it? We, uh, do we have a lot of peace in our world today? Not so much. Not, not as we define it by a world's definition, at least, right? We, we look at the world and we see so much struggle, we see so many difficulties, we hear people say, you know, peace at any cost. That's how dedicated, at least, we say we are to this idea of peace. And yet, just when we think we have it, we lose it. You know, we thought we had peace with, uh, with what, North Korea? And then all of a sudden they found a whole bunch of stuff to shoot off this last week or two, and now it's, you know, back on the, the news and we're worried about peace. I think what the world's really chasing isn't this idea of global peace, but it's more of a peace for me, right? If I'm happy, if I'm at peace, you know what, I'm going to be honest, don't take this the wrong way. I'm really not that worried about you guys in peace. A silly example, but but you'll get what I'm saying here. I've got this um, family member that kind of drives me nuts. His name is Bugsy. <laughs> you didn't think I was going to say one of my kids, or certainly not my wife. I mean, come on. 
I've mentioned Bugsy before. He's about 22 months old, Doberman boxer mix, all sugar, all the time. And, and Bugsy, you know, he's, he's just like anybody else. He wants to have peace. And he is determined that the greatest place to find peace in our house is on my bed. Well, I'll come in the room and, and Bugs will be just laying there all spread out. And he just looks so peaceful and so sweet. And, and he's just, he's content. The problem is that his definition of peace does not match my definition of peace. He's a dog. He smells. He's a puppy. He rolls in other things that smell. And I don't want that on the dog. It's interesting. Kelly, you know, sometimes as we're going to bed, she'll be on the bed with me and she'll get up and leave and the dog, right in there. And I'm like, you are a poor substitute for my wife. Beat it. And so the only way I find peace is when I get what I want, which means the dog is sitting on the floor going, Rawr. He makes some of the strangest noises. When Bugsy's at peace, I'm not, because I'm not getting what I want. Isn't that really kind of in a nutshell where most of us are? Think about where wars really begin. You've got, you've got one nation, or, or maybe we'll, we'll bring it down. We've got one neighbor who does something that the next door neighbor doesn't like. And all of a sudden there's a conflict. And, and because the two can't agree to live in peace, signs go up and we start yelling at each other and uh, you know Facebook just blows up with all that fun stuff and there's no peace for anybody we're going to be looking at this name Jehovah Shalom the Lord is my peace we're going to find it in Judges chapter 6 I'm going to encourage you to take your Bibles and turn there if you're using the Red Pew Bible it's on page 134 you got the U Bible events tab you got the church app you can follow along with as well and as you're turning to Judges 6, let me give you kind of a background of what's going on, not just in chapter 6, but really the entire book of Judges. We went through this book a couple of years ago. And remember, we kept having this cycle of problems. The nation of Israel, by this point in time, should have been really living at peace in the Promised Land. Joshua had brought them in, and they were given a, a command drive out the inhabitants of the land, conquer the land, and then it is yours, Israel. And that was God's expectation. But instead of conquering the land, we see that the, the Israelites often compromised their faith. They thought that, you know what, I can just live alongside these people and have peace. But what really happened is the, the inhabitants of this land influenced Israel they were worshiping false gods, and, and they had false idols, and eventually, instead of Israel um, impacting them for God, they impacted Israel for false gods. And, and Israel turned their back on God, and they fell into sin. And, and then the second part of that cycle is God brought judgment. God made a promise. If you obey me, if you, if you follow me, you'll be blessed. If you don't, there's consequences. People of Israel fell into those consequences. And in, in Genesis, or Genesis, in Judges chapter 6, the people are under the oppression of a group of people called the Midianites. Just one of the, one of the many nations in this cycle of sin and judgment. Now, you may be familiar with the name Midianites. This was a group of people who were descended from Abraham, which we're familiar with. And maybe you're not familiar with one of his wives named Keturah. Sarah had passed away. He met this Keturah, married her. They had a son named Midian among four other ones. And, and this guy ended up being a, a big nation of people. They were very strong and very powerful. They lived in, in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. They were raiders for a long time. This is the land that Moses ran to in the book of Exodus when he killed that slave master and he had to run for his life. He ran down to Midian. And so we have this connection between Israel and Midian for, for some time. And, and in our passage, we're going to join in kind of in the, in the very beginning of this cycle of judgment and oppression for them. How many of you have ever watched the movie A Bug's Life? Come on, don't be ashamed. The ones who should be ashamed are the ones who aren't raising their hands. You've never seen that? It's a great movie. 
It's a Pixar movie, which just automatic, just automatically makes it good. It, you know the, the theme of A Bug's Life, right? You've got two, two people groups, well, insect groups. You've got the ants in their colony, and you've got the grasshoppers. The grasshoppers, they ride around like they're a big motorcycle gang. It's kind of funny. I'm sure they were kind of scruffy on their face. and you know, they blah, 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 blah. Well, if you remember the movie, if you haven't, I don't want to ruin it for you because you need to watch this movie. But the ants knew that the grasshoppers were coming after every harvest. And they were going to steal the ants' food. And so the ants had this task of, of getting enough food to keep the grasshoppers happy and yet having enough to survive on their own. It's kind of what we run into here in the story of Gideon. Now, Bug's Life is not based on this passage, but there's some connections that come here. And look at chapter 6. Let's pick it up in verse 11. It says this, The angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide from the Midianites. So, so here's Gideon, young man who's hiding from the Midianites, just trying to salvage enough food for himself to be able to, uh, to feed his family. He is afraid. Jump to the next verse, 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. We don't have time to get into all the nuances, but usually you don't call a guy hiding underneath the wine press a mighty man of valor, but this angel does. I think he's setting him up for something here. Verse 13, Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. Now, we've got to stop right there. This isn't in your notes. This is free. You don't have to pay for this. But we've got to address that. Gideon says to this angel, he doesn't realize it's an angel of the Lord, and actually doesn't realize it's actually God himself in the form of an angel. He just thinks this is his other guy. This may be a prophet at best. And Gideon says to him, you call me a mighty man of God. Well, where's God? Have you looked around? We've got these grass, I mean, these uh, Midianites coming in on, and they're taking everything that we have. We're, we're oppressed. We have no hope. And then he goes, you know, my my daddy, my, my granddaddy, my great-granddaddy used to tell me these stories about God. Now he provided for the people. He brought them out of Egypt and out of that slavery. and He provided for them as he, they, they walked to the promised land. And even in the, the wanderings, he, he can remember the stories that he was told about how God provided over and over again. And he looks around and he says this very disturbing statement. Where is God I look around, I don't see God. I just see my enemies. Now remember, God did not abandon Israel. It was Israel who turned their back on God. But you know what? So often when we're in our struggles and, and we're in some trials, especially when those trials are consequences of our sin, don't we often ask, okay, God, where are you? I, I thought you loved me. I, I thought you cared about me and we we're going to take care of me. Where's the whole Jehovah uh, Jireh right now? The provider. Just like Gideon, we, we kind of have to have a, an adjustment, a reality check. Israel's in this position because they abandoned God. The beautiful thing is that God forgives and God redeems. And we're going to see that as we go forward. Back to, to verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this mind of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he, Gideon, said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. I compare Gideon to Moses here. Remember, God came to Moses, and he said, Moses, I'm going to have you go in, and you're going to save. Oh, no, you got the wrong guy. And he had his excuses. Gideon has his. He says, listen, I'm, I'm like the smallest guy in my family, and 
My family's like the smallest one. I am the least qualified for this job. If I were to put it in my words, I'd be saying, hey, God, look, I'm no John Wayne. To put it in the younger generation, hey, look, God, I'm not The Rock. I'm not even Dwayne Johnson. Some of you will get that later. It's really the same guy. Okay. Just checking to see if you guys are awake. He starts to make excuses as to why he's unqualified for this job. He gets to the point in verses 17 through 21 where he says to, to this angel, to God himself, he says, all right, I need a sign. It's kind of a pattern in Gideon's life, and it's not necessarily a pattern we're supposed to follow. Again, we don't have time to get into that today. But, but he says, I'm going to go and make you a meal, and I'll be right back. And so Gideon goes home, and, and he kills an animal. He makes a meal, and this takes a while. You know, this isn't just running across the tops getting a bag of fried chicken. This takes some time. He brings it back to this, this individual that he thinks is just a man. And this angel takes his staff and he just touches the food, the rock that the food is on. He just touches it and fire comes up and consumes everything and the angel disappears. Put yourself in Gideon's sandals. Whoa. I thought I was talking to a man and on fire and now he's just gone. I'm getting behind on my notes. I apologize. Gideon panicked at this moment. He realized he wasn't just talking to a man. He realized he was talking to God himself. And, and look at what he says in verse 22. It says, Gideon perceived he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. You know, any time an angel shows up in the word of God, there's usually a very common statement that's made right after that. The angel always says, do not be afraid. Well, he doesn't always say that. And the times that he says, doesn't say that, you need to be afraid. Because the angels come and he's bringing judgment. And Gideon's there before God. And he realizes this is God and not another man. And he panics because he's afraid. And I love what God says to him in verse 23. God offers him peace. He said, the Lord, uh, peace be to you. Do not fear. You shall not die. And Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace, Jehovah Shalom. To this day, it still stands. Gideon is so relieved that he's not going to get struck dead by this angel, by, by God himself. He, he builds an altar to express his gratitude. He worships God, and he names that altar Jehovah Shalom because God had given him peace that very day. Now, I mentioned already, we have a, one definition of peace. And I want to compare and contrast our idea of peace with what God calls shalom. When we talk about peace, we often talk about the absence of things. If I'm not in conflict with somebody, if I'm not in trouble, if I'm not grieving or in distress, I have peace. I don't have those negative things, and so I'm content, I'm happy, it's okay. That's not a bad definition, but, but think about how God's peace the, the word shalom actually doesn't talk about the absence of things. It, it talks about the presence of things. Shalom means something that is whole or complete. There's soundness to it. There's health and safety. Not, not in the sense that you're automatically safe, but there's a feeling of safety and wholeness even in the conflict. So peace, is, as the world defines, is a very superficial thing. It's based on circumstances it's temporary now think about it as long as my day goes well i'm at peace if i don't have somebody you know breaking down the back door trying to steal my sock monkey which i have a sock monkey downstairs i'm not ashamed to admit it if i don't have people banging on my door banging on my head and causing me grief i'm comfortable i'm happy i'm at peace my circumstances are good. God's talking about a totally different idea of peace. It's permanent. It doesn't change. It's not based on what's going on in my life. It's not based on how I feel. It's not based on my abilities, but it is completely based on God's presence. If God is with me, I don't have to be afraid. We talked about that name Jehovah early on. And let me just remind you, that name talks about God's faithfulness. My circumstances are totally out of my control. 
If you work with other people, you know that all it takes is one individual to come up and ruin your day. I work alone most days, and there's still a knucklehead that can come in and ruin it for me. Me. But when I'm basing my, my attitude, my peace on God, He doesn't change. He is completely faithful. He's not going to come and destroy my day because He changes my circumstances. It's a choice that I make. So we've got two sides to this argument. Peace as the world defines it. Peace as we often chase after. And we have this shalom that God offers to us. And here's kind of one of the big keys that you need to get out of this. We want peace in theory, which means we get what we want and people leave us alone, which never happens. We should be chasing after shalom which is found in the presence of God, which means we have to have a relationship with God. Turn over to the book of Romans. It's page 596 in your Red Pew Bibles if you're using that. Otherwise, it's in the notes. We are constantly in a state of conflict in this world. Many ways. Our circumstances are constantly changing, but but when we have a relationship with God, we can find this shalom peace. Paul kind of lays it out for us here in in chapter 5. Look at verse 1. He says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a couple things we've got to just get out of there right away. We are all sinners. Can we just admit that? Are, are, we, are we comfortable with that? Okay. Many of you are nodding your heads. I appreciate that. Um, do we deserve God's love? Do we deserve any of His grace, His mercy, His goodness, His kindness? Any of those things? Of course we don't. In and of ourselves, we are sinners. The reality is sin separates us from God, right? There's, there's this big obstacle standing between us and, and God. We were created to have a relationship with Him. We cannot get to Him because of sin. And yet we read here that we've been justified by faith through Jesus Christ. Because of Christ's work on the cross, paying for our sins, given us the opportunity to be forgiven and have a relationship with God, we are now justified. Now, that's a big word. Let's just kind of remind ourselves of what it means. When we say that we're justified through Christ, it means that we are made right or righteous. God looks at me now because I've accepted Christ as my Savior. He doesn't see me in my sins. He sees me through the blood of Christ. And because Christ is holy and pure, He sees me as holy and pure. It does not mean I am perfect. I I know this is going to surprise some of you. I still sin. You can ask my dog, Bugsy. (laughs) You can ask my kids. You can ask my wife. You can ask my best friends. You can ask almost anybody. I still struggle in some things. But the beautiful thing is because I've accepted Christ's blood, His payment for my sins, when He sees me, He doesn't see me losing my anger. He doesn't see me and and judge me based on on just failing time after time. He sees me as a sinner who's been saved by the grace of God. And that gives me the opportunity to have this relationship with Him. So it all begins right here with that relationship with God. And then He goes on. We, We have peace with God. Now, this is a Greek word here, but it means the same thing as what we've looked at in the Hebrew, the word shalom. To have peace with God means a couple of things. On one level, I'm no longer in conflict with God. We probably don't think about that very much, that I'm at odds with God without Jesus Christ. But the reality is, and we don't like to think about this, but the Bible makes it very clear that if I am not a child of the king, if I have not been saved, I am an enemy of God. We like to divide things up into three categories, right? There's the saved, and there's the the, uh, unsaved, and then there's us in the middle. We're saved, but we still struggle, but God still loves us. Listen, before we came to Christ, we were enemies of God. His wrath was focused on us. We, We don't want to think about him as being an angry guy. 
But the Bible makes it very clear. Now that I have been justified by Christ, I am no longer his enemy. I'm no longer at odds with him. I'm now a, a child of the king. I'm whole. I'm complete. I have health and I have safety. All that comes because of this peace that we have. And along with that peace, we see a couple other things that we gain in verse 2. It says, through him we also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. I think the word grace is one of the most important words that we will have in our life when we read through the scriptures. Think about what that word means. We, we usually define it very simply, right? It, grace is receiving good things we don't deserve. If I were to show up at my house, I did this just last night. I, I took Kyle up to a neighbor's house to take care of their cats, and, and, and he looked at me with those puppy dogs. He, he's got better puppy eyes than Bugsy does. And, and he looked at me, and as we are about to turn left to go home, he goes, couldn't we turn right? Well, you know what's right? It's tops and it's ice cream. I know you're thinking, Dan, that's not like a big deal for you. You like just inject it. Well, no, I don't. I'm trying to quit. And I said, okay, I'm go- I, I extended grace. Good things that that kid definitely did not deserve. His head just popped up back there. I, I wanted to do a good thing for my kids, for my wife. I wanted to bless them. It's a simple, silly example, but, but think of the many ways that God blesses us. It gives us grace. Is everybody here breathing? If your neighbor's not breathing, nudge them. They may need a CPAP machine. We're breathing. That's a grace that God extends to us. We have family, most of us. We have jobs that maybe we don't like it so much, but it's paying the bills. And and even if it's not paying the bills, you know what? We're all alive. We're upright, and maybe we're a little hungry, but that's still a major blessing that God gives to us. We have all these physical blessings. Let's talk spiritual graces. Christ died so that I could live. I don't deserve that. I don't have any any right to demand that. I could never repay that. And yet God said, in my grace, in my love, Dan, I'm going to send Jesus Christ to die for you. And you all could put your name in that statement as well. That is a major grace that God gives to us. But then it goes even farther. It's not just that I'm no longer at conflict with God. I'm now his child. I'm no longer a slave. I'm a son or a daughter of the king. And that grace extends even farther. In the New Testament, we read about spiritual gifts. That word gift can also be translated as the word grace. Think about it. It's God's grace that he gives us uh, abilities and talents and passions and skills and, and spiritual gifts that we can use to serve him, to build his church and to build his kingdom. That's a spiritual grace that we never think about. Paul says, through him, We have the faith, uh, through our faith in Jesus Christ, we can stand on those graces. So peace with God brings us that grace. It also brings us joy. Verse 2, Paul makes this little statement, and we rejoice. Now this word rejoice in your text, it's really not the best word that it could be translated. The word that Paul's really using means to boast or to glory in. Now think about that. Yes, we're supposed to rejoice, but our rejoicing should be so great that we can't stop talking about it. I, uh, as a coach, there's been times when I've had one or two players who, who pretty much thought the ten people around him were like his supporting cast. And he would boast about the things that... I had one guy one year who just would brag about things, you know, like, oh, I, I walked on Mars. He totally believed it, I think. And I'm just looking at him like, really? That's amazing. We're supposed to boast in the grace that God has given to us. 
the peace that we have with God, we should be boasting and, and glorifying it, not for our name, but for God. When was the last time you couldn't keep your mouth shut about what God has been doing in your life? Has it been a while? And maybe we're not following through with this expectation that we rejoice in these things that uh, God is doing for us. And and Paul continues in verse 2. He says, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, that, uh, that, that thought of hope, it's not the word that we use frequently, like I hope before I go to my next doctor I've lost 47 pounds as I'm eating a drumstick. It's a confidence, it's a knowledge that what God has said is going to happen. Because He is Jehovah, He's faithful, I can be very confident that He will fulfill His promises. Because He's Jehovah Jireh, Lord our provider, I can be confident He's going to provide for me. So my hope is in Him. Here we're talking about the hope of the glory of God. I'm anticipating Christ's return. That is the day, and I am so looking forward to this day, when my knees stop hurting, my ankles stop hurting, my hips start hurting, my head stops hurting. I just stop hurting in general. I'm looking forward to that day. And it comes when Christ returns. We get the glorified body. And here's the beautiful thing. All of creation is reset. It's restored, it's renewed, it's, it's recreated to be exactly how God intended it to be before sin. I am looking forward to that day intensely. Some of the people we have been praying for for months and years are looking forward to that day. And so there's this hope, there's this future aspect of the hope that we have in the glory of God. Now, there's also a present side to this probably every single one of us in this room can think of a trial or a set of circumstances we don't want to be in at this moment i mean we have hope in the glory of god in our trials i I could be going through difficult times and, and i can face them with joy because i know that god is going to provide God is going to take, he's made a promise that my trial will not last forever. You know what that means? That means it could end today. It could end tomorrow. It could end next year. Or quite honestly, it could end the day I die. But I know that after my death, when I'm with God himself, that trial is over. And so at the very least, I have just this, brief whisper of time that I have to deal with this. And then I'm whole for eternity. There's this promise that God makes that that these trials will not chase us into eternity. We'll have victory over these things. That's why Paul goes on in verse 3 and he says, we rejoice and we boast in our sufferings. We learned this concept in the book of Job. We just need to review it probably every 10 minutes or so for some of us. We rejoice and we boast in our sufferings. Now, it doesn't mean that we go around and say, woo I just got hit by a car. Yes. Or, hey, look, my leg's broken and going, or my shoulder's broken, or my hip is broken. We don't rejoice in the suffering itself. The reality is we cry, we mourn, we grieve, not to the point that we lose hope. We, we find joy not in the pain, but in the results that the pain, the trials, the circumstances we go through bring to us. God has promised that he will always use these trials, these circumstances that are wanted to grow us to be more like Christ. Look at verse 3. It says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit has been given to us. So Paul brings up this, this little pathway for us. It, many of you don't realize this, but uh, if you've ever coached at a school, you realize what season it is right now. Conditioning season. Some of you are, are runners, and some of you are soccer players and football players, and you know what? They're already out there busting their tails. And when we got to conditioning week, conditioning week as a coach was one of my favorite weeks. And I know you're thinking, it's because Dan just likes to make kids suffer and run. And you're absolutely correct. (laughs) 
I do. Better them than me. But there's a bigger point behind conditioning them. We have the kids running and training because we know that they're going to come up against opponents that are bigger than them, that are faster than them. You know, the soccer team in Chautauqua Lake, the guys' soccer team last couple of years has not been uh, giants. They have not been these, you know, rocks coming down the field playing soccer. They've been average size, kind of puny guys at times. And I realize we're not going to outmuscle the opponents. We may not be able to outrun our opponents, but we can always outlast our opponents. And so this suffering that they go through brings endurance. We're building up their capacity for pain in some senses, but an endurance level to help them finish the game. When we get into a game against some teams, 90 minutes, 110 minutes in overtime, it's usually the guys who are still upright that are going to tend to win. We, we had the last two seasons I coached, we had uh, biggest games of the year against Southwestern, arch rivals. Both games went into overtime. And the kids were like, Coach, we can't do this. Southwestern, when we played them on their field, blew us out both years. We took them to overtime. We, I shouldn't smile so much, we ruined their perfect season one year. Yeah, no, don't clap at that. Um, why were my kids able to do that? Because we'd worked really hard at conditioning. They weren't better players. They weren't stronger or faster. But they had built up endurance. And, and Paul says that suffering brings endurance, and endurance brings character. That year, when, when our kids got down, man, they, they just picked each other up. It was great. In some senses, they, they were building character. I always hate that statement when I'm going through a different thing. Oh, troubles bring character. Yeah, but it's true. You know, in my my spiritual life, I I look at the suffering, the, the unwanted circumstances that I've gone through early, and I think about how difficult they were at the time, and then I look at the things I'm going through today, and it's like exponentially more difficult. And yet I can look back and I can see God brought me through those. He, he's proven himself faithful here. Why would I think he's not going to prove himself faithful today? My character, my Christ likeness grows as my endurance grows through my suffering. And then Paul says, you put those three together and we have this unfailing hope. I can look at what God's doing in my life, and while I don't know really what the the next step brings, I I don't know where that path goes, I don't know the end results of what I'm doing, but I know, because God has proven Himself faithful in the past, I can trust Him today, and my hope will be real. It'll be unfailing. Not just because I read about some guy named Gideon, who God called and freaked him out a little bit when he realized it was God and then goes on with 300 men and defeats this massive army. And not just because I read about Moses and Elijah and Peter and Paul and all. Those are great stories of faith and I need those. But you know what? I can go back and say, I remember when my son was this age. He was sick. And I can remember when God provided in, in this situation with my family. And I can see how God provided in, in this specific thing. See, it's, it's not just head knowledge practical experience. I've witnessed God bring peace into our life through very difficult situations. And just really quickly, because God is Jehovah Shalom, we have that peace. God gives us peace through Jesus Christ. We can approach God as we never could before because we are His children. And that means that we can approach Him anytime, any place in any condition. Even when I have sinned intentionally, repeatedly, I can still go to God and confess that sin and He is going to forgive me every time. He has promised it. It is true. The only reason we can pray to God is because He is our peace. Jehovah Shalom. 
And then we can find peace regardless of what circumstances we face. It doesn't matter. I, I can tell you right now that I'm not in a place of peace because I have an absence of conflict in my life or an absence of trouble. But instead I have a presence of God. And He allows me to be whole. He allows me to be complete. He allows me to be joyful even when I don't like what's going on around me. I don't know what burdens everyone is bearing today, but let me encourage you. True peace begins with Jesus Christ. If you don't know him as your personal Savior, you can hunt all you want and you can find short-term peace. But you'll never have the shalom that he wants unless you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't made that decision, stop me today is before you go out. Let me talk with you. Let me introduce you. We'll get somebody else to talk to you and, and explain to you what it really means to be in a solid, practical, life-changing relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ. And if you already have that relationship, here's the thing. We have shalom, right? We have shalom extended to us. Our problem is we don't take advantage of it. We go to God and we say, okay, God, here's my request. Here's my burdens. I need you to take care of it. Thank you, and I'll just take it back with me. I've got to leave it there, right? That's hard to do. What, what does it really mean to leave my burdens at Christ's feet? Well, it means that every time I start to think up, I go, nope. Jesus has that. I gave that to him. I'm going to rest in his peace. And I'm going to tell you, it's a constant reminding of ourselves that I am not going to fight this fight any longer. Jehovah Shalom, God gives us peace. I hope that you're able to enjoy the blessing that comes with that name. Peace, oh, it's a beautiful thing when it's the peace of God in our lives. Would you stand with me as we close? Father, yeah, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your love for us. And God, as, as I struggle many days with that sense of true peace, God, I just pray that you would help all of us as your children to see what it means to trust in Jehovah Shalom. And I pray in that name right now, and I ask for your peace to be extended to everyone here. Uh, those that do not know you, that do not have that personal relationship, who are maybe even just going through the motions. God, I ask that today would be the day. Maybe they get freaked out a little bit by being in your presence and they realize what they truly need is that relationship. God, for my brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling with peace as well. God, I ask that we would see you in the middle of the circumstances. We would hear your voice in the middle of the storms. And we would just cast all of our burdens, all of our cares on you. And that we would love you. And that we would trust you to be the shalom that we need this morning. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Your word. Your word alone.
righteousness is all our plea. Your lost events are satisfied. His perfect work has set us free. Gloria, Gloria, glory to God. ask you to just take a quick seat. I want to have uh, Ailey and Sonia come up here. Have my deacons come up. I got a couple of you here today. Come up here with me. Uh, missions team, if you want to come up and join us, you can as well. We want to take just a moment and lift these two up on their mission trip to Togo. Uh, leave Wednesday night for Newark, which may be the most dangerous part of the journey, and then to Togo for two months. And uh, what a blessing it is for us as a church to be able to partner with these two. Uh, Sonia's been a part of our church for like a thousand years. Um, doesn't look it though, does she? And, and she uh, brought Ailey into partnership with us, whether he liked it or not. He is part of our church as well. And they've been just a great blessing to us. Um, just real quick, what are some solid personal things we could be praying for on this trip? Wisdom. And uh, we, our bodies is very, very, uh, we have many things to do and to finish. <laughs> yes. And we need God to give us strength to, to do all those, okay. those things that we do. Very packed schedule. They're going to be going from north to south and crossing rivers, and who knows how full those rivers will be. So that's legitimate uh, prayer requests that we need wisdom and then just. Uh, he, he's going out there with the opportunity to, to pastor to pastors and to pastor to churches. And what a, what a major blessing that is. So let's just take a moment. I'm going to pray over you guys. And then I'm going to just, you know, as we close and as we dismiss, you guys are more than welcome. Keep them here for a while. They have no other plans today. Anyway, uh, just let them know you're going to be praying for them. But let's go to God in prayer. Are you guys ready? Father God, I just lift up Ailey. I lift up Sonia to you. I thank you for their friendship. I thank you for their heart, for the church, for this church here, but also the church in Togo. Lord, while we've never met any of them, they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we lift them up today as well. Be preparing their hearts and their hands to receive Ailey and Sonia. Be with them as they uh, are going to be challenged in their work, in their ministry. That you would just encourage them. Lord, I think of these pastors that are going to uh, be given resources and training that you would just use this time, Lord, to, to uh, build your church in West Africa. Father, we pray very specifically for wisdom for these two as they uh, approach this trip. Give them uh, clear guidance. Give them the right words at the right time with the right heart. Lord, we think of all the logistics, the very busy schedule. We think of uh, the luggage as simple as that seems, Lord, that luggage has got a lot of the resources that they need in order to minister there. And so, Father, get that luggage there in one piece at the right time. 
And Father, regardless of what obstacles are thrown in front of them over the next two months, give them the right heart attitude, the right mindset, knowing that they are your servants, that they are your children, and they're there on task for the kingdom. God, just bless them. Help us as a church to remember them throughout the days, throughout the weeks, that we will be lifting them up in prayer consistently, and that we will be partnering with them in the ministry. Father God, I pray that above all, your kingdom would grow. Not our empires, but your kingdom. And we would see lives changed. We would see Christians become more committed and more assertive in their faith. We would see pastors grow in their courage and their ability to share the gospel. And Father, that we would see people come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Father God, we love you. We love Ailey, we love Sonia. We just pray your hand of blessing and protection on them in these days to come. And Lord, when we come back together in a few months, we will be able to rejoice at the great work that has been done, not through the effort of these two, but through their willingness to submit to you alone. And we'll worship you and we'll glorify you then and now in Christ's name. Amen. God bless. Have a great day. Last life group is tonight, so if you haven't been a part, be a part of it.